I'll, I'll now request editor News 18 India and News 18 JKLH Jyoti Kamalji to welcome our next panelist on the stage, Shan Bhatnagar, artist, collector, and a maximalist interiors architect. Shan Bhatnagar is a painter, curator, and interior designer whose vibrant artworks are a distinct take on the traditional temple art of Pichwai. He is also a conservationist, working to save the dying crafts of the country and actively helps to incorporate crafts in interior projects and collectibles. He has worked with royal families of Rajasthan to design and renovate spaces. Let's begin with this session. We welcome you, sir. Over to you, Jyoti Kamal. Thank you, Ashi. Thank you, Sean, for taking the time out and being with us here at La Aspiration. This is the second ed edition that we are doing in Chandigarh. So, um, starting off right away, Pichwai painting, that whole style, that whole art that you specialize in, that you're a master of, what is it about? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's very special to be in Chandigarh because I actually grew up in Chandigarh. And uh, I, I used to study at the Vivek High School. And I think that um, being here and seeing the homes of beautiful homes that exist in Chandigarh and how proud people were of the homes and the gardens that they had here has shaped me into who I am today. So I'm very happy to be here in Chandigarh and thank you for having me. Uh, speaking about pitch-wise, um, I find them very aesthetic. I find them very uh, regal. Uh, you know, they have lots of, lots of stories. They've, uh, they are these wall hangings that are hung behind in Nathwara, at the temple of Sri Nachi. And so the word pitchwai really means something that hangs behind. Pitch means behind and why means a textile. So the textile that hangs behind Sri Nachi is called a pitchwai. And uh, why I got interested in it is because I was studying, I was studying in Germany and uh, I studied uh, art appreciation. And part of my program was about the Indian traditional paintings and I chose Pichwai as my theme. So I feel that, you know, it's got great meaning, great stories, beautiful subject, very ornate, and they're made in uh, different parts, including Germany. So some of the net Pichwais were actually made in Nottingham and Germany. So it's, you know, spread across uh, the entire world almost. So you started in Chattika. That's an interesting thing that you just told us about. Uh, again, when did you kind of really think that, okay, this is something that I would like to kind of take as a profession? Because you have made a name for yourself. Your paintings are absolutely sought after. They are kind of hung in the best of places. The Reliance Foundation has them. So it's, it's something that is in huge demand. But was there a point at which you decided, OK, this is what I want to do? Or did you kind of follow through with a traditional kind of learning course and then said, OK, let me experiment with this? And then the experiment turned into a profession. How did it go? Actually, it's all by default, I think. Um, I was studying something totally different, but I was always interested in it. Um, and I think reading about it, learning about it, that kind of got me more interested in uh, painting. I, actually, I don't do the pitch why. Uh, I, I have my own take on the pitch why. So these are oil on canvas, and then I embellish them. Um, I stitch on them, and it's, it's recreating the darshan that I've had at Nathwara. So, yeah, so I've seen, I mean, just to kind of add to the fact that you're saying that it's a different take, instead of using the natural dyes, you use oil paints. That's and right. secondly, you don't just kind of use natural dyes and kind of create a painting. You actually embellish it with Rajasthani jewelry, right. borders, yes. motifs. So it's actually got a 3D feel to it. It's not yes. a flat painting. It's got yes. elements to it. Yes. So that's something that you've added to it, which has made it very unique and a very collectible item because of what you're kind of putting in there. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, I don't intend it to be a collectible. I get so attached to all my paintings that I You don't want to hard. give them away. <laughs> I don't want to give them away. But um, what I try to do is to recreate what I've seen. And uh, for me, I think um, that's most important. Mm -hmm. And if people love it and people like it, then I think that's even better. So um, I think the whole process is really a lot of fun. The reading, the knowing, the, you know, getting to know the stories, um, finding out, uh, you know, various mediums that I can work with. I think that whole process is most interesting. And that's what I look forward to rather than the finished work. And, and then I get very attached to them. But you know, that's an interesting thought that you just kind of, um, kind of uh, spoke about, that as a creator, as an artist, as anybody who kind of puts in a lot of effort to make something, you get attached to it in the process of making it. And as you get attached to it, you kind of form a bond with it in a way. Yes. And as you form a bond with it, 
Now you don't want to let go of it. <laughs> so how does that then turn into a profession? Because you have got to create this thing, build an absolute bond with it, and then at some point in time, decide to give it away. I think that's where the value in art also comes in, probably. The more attached an artist would be to their art, I think the more valuable that piece of art would also be. I don't know. Just exploring. That uh, is, is, how would you want to give away your art? Because you would form a bond with it. Yeah, initially it was very hard, but now it's okay. Um, but <laughs> I don't, I mean, form, forming a bond is really with the process, I feel. The finished work is fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's hanging in beautiful homes, and I like to see them sometimes in magazines and sometimes otherwise when I visit. But um, I think um, it's not about how the investment has grown and how valuable they are, but I think the whole idea of sharing Srinaji or sharing my love of Pichwai yeah. Uh, with others and then I also do these workshops and um, talks and I'm writing a book right now on uh, Sri Najit so that younger children can understand this art form better. So I think that sharing it with others is more of you know something that gives me a better um, you know gives me a high actually to really share it with others and I think that the, uh, the bond is with the process and I feel that this is the only time I'm going to do it or I'll be able to do it but it just grows and grows from there. Srinachi is the Bal Krishan. So, uh, is there a spiritual angle to your paintings also, or is it is it a professional angle, or uh, is is there a certain spirituality that you sense? Because uh, the images that I saw of your paintings, they are they've got a very distinctive style, even to the eyes, like you make them in that fish style of eyes, mm -hmm. and then the colors that you use are bold, kind of. You would have a painting made with absolute black kind of uh, shades, also gray shades. Right. So. Is there a spiritual kind of connect to what you're doing or, uh, or I mean, what is it? I, I think spiritual is the right word. I wouldn't say religious, but I do feel that there is a spiritual connect. Uh, if you talk about religious, uh, then I'm not really a textbook uh, Vaishnav because I do whatever I want to do and I don't really want to follow any rules. But um, spiritual definitely does connect me to another uh, greater self. And while I'm painting the whole, you know, while, or listening to Haveli Sangeet or uh, talking about it, it really does connect me uh, at another level of spirituality. We are talking about luxury here. We are also talking about absolute high-end art and art that takes a lot of effort. So even the last time round when we had this uh, kind of aspiration, the first uh, round that we did, so we were trying to understand what does one really mean by luxury? Hmm. What does it really mean? It's, it's not what one traditionally thinks it is, that you spend money, you buy something expensive, that's luxury. Because right. luxury at the end of the day is something which is very exclusive, something which stands apart. And by the mere fact that it's exclusive and it stands apart, it has to be rare. And if it has to be rare, then it has to be built with that much effort and thought going into it, whether it's thought, whether it's effort, whether it's materials, whether it's craftsmanship, whether it's the idea. And that's what sets it apart and that's what gives it, gives it its value. So is that how you define luxury? How would you kind of rate it? Because I would say even a temple, which is made with huge elaborate kind of efforts is luxury in a way, mm -hmm. because you could have made it simpler. But the very right. fact that you put in so much effort into building it, yeah. the kind of engineering cuts that you made to it, the whole effort that was put into it, would kind of put it in a different category. How would you like to look at this? If you had yeah. to add to the exploration of the word luxury? Yeah, luxury I think is a state of mind. Um, it's not how much work, one has put in, I've seen, re, uh, you know, beautiful um, temples that are very simple, uh, but aesthetically pleasing. And I've seen uh, new constructed temples or, uh, you know, buildings that have taken a lot of time, but are very ugly. So, you know, and, and probably a lot of money, but they're extremely ugly and they're not inspiring at all. So I think luxury is really just a state of mind. It's aesthetics. It's something that pleases your senses. It's something that, um, you know, gives it... So it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be just rare, but something I feel that more to it, something that is um, balanced, aesthetic, gives you a sense of uh, pride, a uh, nice feeling when you see it. I think all of that, you know, buying an expensive bag, for example, can be termed as luxury, but that may not always be uh, true. So I think that some things can be very ugly and still be expensive. And I, I, you know, luxury is not really how much time one has spent on it but what it gives you back. The stock, market, the stock market is something that people invest in. People invest in a lot of other things. You invest in property, you invest in the stock markets. Suddenly there is this whole trend of investing in art now. One is seeing a number of new, in fact, digital initiatives which talk about fractional ownership of art. 
that you don't have to buy something worth a million dollars. You can probably put in a thousand dollars into it and then expect that as the value of the art rises to two million dollars, your thousand dollars become two thousand dollars. So how do you look upon this whole idea of art as an investment and are you seeing this trend pick up? Are you seeing, are you seeing people queue up to kind of invest in art? It's very limited at the moment. Um, I think it's only for the masters. Uh, some of those artists are not even alive anymore. So I think it's something that doesn't um, affect artists who are living and working at the moment. Uh, investing in art is a very different... The people who are investing in art may not be art lovers. They're just investing in an object. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, it's great for an investor, but for an artist who's working currently, or an artist whose uh, you know, works are very good, but hasn't had the platform to show them, I think then it makes zero sense for people investing in art, because I think they're really investing in an object. For example, just for, just for an example, they may be buying a Sousa or buying a Raza. Um, some of these artists not live, um, and, and that value keeps growing, and the same painting will keep coming in the market, or uh, paintings of the same artists, but that's really not doing anything to the world of art per se. So, Sean, before we kind of uh, end, um, just to kind of completely change to a different side, that not just art, you also do interior design. And you do something called maximalist interior design. What does that mean, maximalist interior design? Um, you know, these are terms that we've created, minimalism, maximalism. But India is all about surface decoration, uh, right from Mohan Jodaro to the Rajput palaces, the Mughal palaces, uh, the temples. It's always, always been about surface design. Uh, there's always been uh, carvings, or uh, even if it's a small, even if it's something that will go on the elephant, uh, that cover that goes, that velvet cover that uh, is, uh, you know, used to decorate the elephant, has such intricate embroideries, you know, and even something that will get missed has, uh, or, or something that will be behind, for example, the Pichwai, which is behind the deity of Srinath, even that has so much detail. So I think that India is, well, whether you want to call it maximalism or minimalism, India is about surface design, and I think that uh, when they say God is in the details, I don't think God is in the detail of a very minimalist, plain white and white sofa, and you know, it's really just very plain. Not uh, And also that uh, maximalism or minimalism, it depends on the place that you're living in also. I think the, it, the climate of that place is very important. So uh, in India, most of the Havelis used to have a courtyard in the middle, uh, and it was open to sky and then uh, the rooms would be around the courtyard. And I think that is conducive to the environment, conducive to the hot weather in, um, in India, in the plains of India, uh, where you know, there would be circulation of air. The lattice, the jalis that were intricately carved would uh, trap in cool breeze. So that, you know, um, uh, of course, it painstakingly carved jalis, but they would add to the beauty, but also it had a purpose. It wasn't just there to add uh, beauty and aesthetics, but it had a purpose also. So I think that those things have remained as part of our culture today. When you go to any of the forts and palaces, especially because I'm from Jaipur, and we have lots of palaces and lots of uh, forts, and all of them are uh, beautiful, you know, frescoes on it, surface decoration, lattice jalis, and things like that. So um, they, they always, they were of course aesthetic, but they also had a purpose and meaning. Uh, to everything. There's Araish, there's this form of uh, plaster that, uh, you know, takes a long, it's a long, long process um, and it's about three and a half feet of skirting around uh, every room and the floor. It's made of marble dust and seashells and uh, the whole process of making it is very uh, tedious. But it, it was not only was it beautiful and they had fr uh, frescoes painted on them, but it also served as cool surfaces to walk on in a hot, very hot Rajasthan, the desert, uh, you know, uh, state. So uh, I feel that maximalism or surface decoration is part of our culture. It's something that we don't have to think. I think you force yourself. Nowadays, a lot of these homes are clones of Western homes. And I think the glass and steel, why do you want to trap in more sun when it's already very hot? So, you know, the glass and steel structure is very uninspiring, if you ask me. And the plain white interiors don't really inspire me much. But um, I, I feel that it's part of my culture, always been part of my culture. India is an amazing country in terms of the kind of traditions and options that exist here. We had, I mean, you have traveled all over the world, so you would have, you've studied in the US, you would have seen like in the Nordic countries, they're very minimalist oriented. In fact, the more minimalist 
a thing is, the more valuable it would be. And for a maximalist, it's in fact strange to find something made very simply being very expensive. But then their society's orientation is towards probably simplifying things because work at home, if like is available in India, wouldn't be there. So you would generally want things to be kept clean, neat, simple, rounded edges and everything. So minimalism there and maximalism. But it's, it's an interesting thought nonetheless. Thank you so much, Shan, for um, kind of taking the time out and joining us here. And Thank welcome back so to much. Chandigarh. You studied here. Good yes. to have you here. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shan. Thank you, Jyoti Kamal. Uh, we'll request you to be here on the stage for the felicitation, Shan Bhatnagar. Thank you, Shan. I'll request Jyoti Kamalji to please stay on the stage. Now we'll move on to our next session.